Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about, there are, uh, just to clarify, we have about three projects in the Soil and Crop Science Department that are related to food quality and nutrition. But I selected this one to focus on because it, it, it's uh, uh, the approach we are using so that to enlighten, especially those people who are interested in, in uh, branching into international research to see what kind of an approach we are using and how it's a little different from what is typically been done over, uh, over the, 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 the past few decades. This is a, a CRISP project and it's uh, again funded by USAID and also of course Texas AgriLife is supporting part of it. And the countries that you're working with are Zambia and Kenya. Those are our host countries for this particular project. And then, of course, we're partnering with South Africa. The other projects we work on actually include uh, countries in Southern Africa as well as South America, on Central America, sorry. But I'm going to focus this today just on this particular one. Okay, the background and rationale for this project. Most, when you talk about nutrition type projects internationally, the focus has always been on increasing iron zinc bioavailability or iron zinc nutrition as well as maybe vitamin A because, and sometimes protein, because these are typically the biggest problems when you talk about malnutrition. And this, uh, I think over the past 50 years, a lot of progress has been made. But in my opinion, we have not made as much progress as we would have made simply because the reality is, and this may be controversial, you may not agree with me, but this is the way I, I see it. If a project focuses exclusively on the poorest of a segment of a society, the chances of making real progress are very, very limited. I mean, it will we, feel good when we want to help the poor. It's, it's easy to sell politically, to get money to do something that really is helping the extremely poor people. But the reality is that if you ignore the other segments of the economy, mostly the middle class, the progress you're going to make is going to be extremely limited because the poor people generally have very limited purchasing power. And that was one of the motivations for this particular project. The paradox in Africa right now, we know malnutrition, zinc, iron, and related protein. Malnutrition, very common. And when you think about those, we typically think of starving kids, which is really still a big problem in Africa and Asia. But the other side of the problem is that we are increasing, basically really increasing incidences of obesity and related problems. Actually, if you look at countries like Egypt and South Africa, these incidences of obesity are about as high as in the U.S., which is a much more, develop, of course, a developed country. So you see that the problems we have in Africa are kind of getting very similar to the problems we have in the U.S. But the paradox is that in Africa, you still have a very large chunk of the population that is also still malnourished, that is still not getting enough nutrition. So you have people who are getting too much nutrition, people getting very little nutrition, and very few in between. And to give just uh, uh, an example of a data that I gathered just for, for Kenya as an example here, we see that in the urban, again, population, these are data that are fairly recent, I think 2007 to 2010, you see that uh, incidences of obesity alone, and this doesn't include overweight, uh, in, uh, in, in urban, among adults, very high in Kenya, and especially among women, 16% is the average, but among women is approaching 30% in the urban centers. Basically, and so that is really, really a huge problem. Of course, compared to the rural, it's much lower. Again, this is even a problem among kids, very young kids, as early as six, seven years old. This research focused on 11-year-olds, and they found that, again, urban girls, 17% are overweight or basically obese, and among urban boys, it's about 7%. So, and this is growing, and the trend has been basically upward over the past few years. The rural, of course, they're much more physically active, so the incidences of obesity are much lower. But in the rural, pro the problem we have again is underweight. Children who are malnourished on the other side of the spectrum, very high among the rural children in Kenya and relatively low among the urban children in Kenya. And so the goal is you are trying to find a research projects that would actually bridge the gap. We want to help both sides of the spectrum such that they come to the middle. We don't want to just focus on one side at the expense of the other because the society is tending more towards the obese side now than to the, 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 the malnourished side. Okay, you got Okay. The most vulnerable groups, again, just to cover it off, are 
Now in Africa, we typically say these are the poor people living in villages where there's no rainfall. But now I add to that the middle class in the urban areas are very vulnerable because if you look at, again, I, I, I did not include that data here, but incidences of diabetes, for example, are getting very, it's becoming a very big problem in Kenya. It used to be that AIDS cases used to be the biggest consumer of, uh, of medical, whatever, uh, of medical related needs, the government resources. But now they're seeing much more cases related to diabetes. And cardiovascular disease, really consuming more of that, the government resources, the very limited resources that we have. And so this needs to be addressed. So I think the vulnerable groups include not just the really poor, but also the middle class in Africa. And aware, but the, the thing is, the benefit, we can address this because I've been going to Africa almost every year since I came to the US more than 10 years ago, and there's been a shift. Right now, when you go to Africa, you see a lot of people really into healthy products. They're trying to look, you go to supermarkets, you find a lot of things that are basically advertising high in nutritious or antioxidant or healthy things that it traditionally we would not think would sell well in Africa. And I say the middle class is extremely important because number one, the middle class, they're the trendsetters in society. Typically, when you have a lot of poor people, when you're poor, you look up to the middle class. You wanna, as soon as you get out of poverty or the little money you get, you wanna live the lifestyle that the middle class lives. So the middle class is typically the trendsetter in Africa and everybody who is poor dreams of one day being able to number one, again, in Africa, the need for the, the most basic need is food. If you're poor, you can't afford good food. So when you, as soon as you upgrade, you want to upgrade to the kind of food that the middle class consumes. So the middle class basically sets the trend in society. Unfortunately, the middle class, they upgrade, when they upgrade, they upgrade to Western style diets. And that is why it comes with the consequences of obesity and heart disease, sorry, and related problems. So the middle class are a very important trendsetter. And number two, they have the purchasing power. The middle class are the people who really drive the economy. If you have a product that the middle class will want to consume, then you're much more likely to have a sustained system. If you just focus on the poor, it will work as long as donor funding is there. But as soon as you withdraw the donor funding, there's not enough purchasing power to sustain that market. And there will be no incentive to invest in that kind of a market. Again, this I've talked about, the evidence for heart disease and related problems in Africa. And again, Africa is really increasingly looking for health promotion. Actually, last, a few months ago, we went to Africa with Suzanne Talcott. She's somewhere here. And she saw that, yes, in the supermarkets, every, uh, almost one quarter of the products were advertising some health properties that you would, uh, basically the same thing you'd see in an American grocery store is what you'd see in an African grocery store in the urban areas. So it tells you that, again, these people are looking, the, the middle class is really looking to be, to be healthy. And why did we choose cowpea? Again, I'm going to talk about that, I think, on the next slide. But there's opportunity, the cowpea is, a number. Uh, let me just talk about it here. Cowpea, number one, is a very drought-tolerant crop. Number one. Number two, cowpea is a crop that is widely produced in Africa. Africa is the largest producer and consumer of cowpea. So it's not a new crop. It's not something that you're going to introduce from somewhere. It's kind of indigenous. It's a traditional crop. Very drought tolerant and also very low input type of a crop. It can do well with very limited input. And so it's something that the poor people can grow and actually may get something out of. On the other hand, it's something that is uh, uh, the, the, the wealthy people can, uh, can buy and consume and actually derive the health benefits from it. And that's what we are hoping. But there's no evidence for that. And that is what the f this project is supposed to focus on. Because for now, typically, as we said, it's traditionally consumed in the villages. And so when people upgrade to the urban centers, what uh, the trend seems to be that when they upgrade, they stop consuming things like cowpea or even beans. When people upgrade, they want to consume more meat and related products. And then, so they ignore the traditional crops. And these are basically the ones, if you are looking for healthy things, we want them to look for the healthy things in these traditional crops, instead of trying to look for a, trying to upgrade to the Western style diet that is actually causing all the problems that we, we are seeing increasingly in Africa. Again, so I've said, Cowpea has a very good agronomic profile, drought tolerant, <coughs> quick maturity, and also very uh, kind of, you don't need much of an input to get something out of it. And it's a familiar crop. You see the production map for cowpea 
you see that Africa, I think, produces about, I may be wrong, but not very far from the truth. If I say Africa produces about three quarters of the world cowpea and consumes about three quarters of the world cowpea. So it's a, very f it's a crop that many parts of sub-Saharan Africa is very familiar with. They grow it, they consume it. But as I've told you, the problem is when the people, when you, they get more wealthy, they don't want to really move away from that kind of a product and consume more of the meat and related product, which is causing, I believe, much of the problem. The constraints, as I said again, to consuming this kind of traditional foods, number one, is perception. When you're poor and you're consuming this food and the wealthy person is consuming that, as soon as you get money, you want to consume that. And you don't want to be reminded of the thing you used to consume when you were poor. I've mentioned that. And so perception problem is really keeping demand and use of these traditional crops down. And again, villages. Typically, I actually I was talking to somebody two months ago in Africa, and they're saying, oh, cowpea, I can't use it. It's too villagey. That's kind of a village food. That's not something. And so really attitude to change that perception. The urban dwellers really move away from that, and the traditional uh, kind of village dwellers I feel like they're stuck with it. They really don't have much of an option. And that kind of limits basically incentive to actually invest into that system. And so our goal here is to promote use of cowpea to improve health and nutrition and food security in Africa. We don't want cowpea production to die, but we want this to be based on sound science because every, this, uh, the local newspapers I was reading, every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, they have columns on nutrition and health where they highlight some specific foods that have been shown to have health benefits. And I saw broccoli, I saw all these kinds of fruits, and I saw everything. And I hope that one day, cowpea will be one on, the li on that list because the middle class, they read the newspaper and they believe a lot what they read, what the doctors say on TV, for example, that this has been shown to have this, this could help reduce diabetes. They really buy into that, and we are hoping that uh, through science, we can actually demonstrate that cowpea has health benefits that the middle class would actually want to buy into and they would want to increase the demand for this particular crop. And so hopefully we will build sustainable systems. These are just our specific objectives. I think I've mentioned those in, uh, in, uh, 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 through my talk, so I'm not going to go through them. Uh, they are mostly basically in line with mo what most Chris projects are, but specifically we are focusing on health that can appeal to both the middle class and the poor at the same time. Again, I'm just going to go through a few pictures here to, uh, uh, and I tell stories. For those who are interested in international projects, again, you could pick something. This incredible diversity in cowpea. So our approach is you have so much diversity, but how do you select the ones that could demonstrate the best health benefits? And the health benefits you're focusing on are include uh, basically cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. These are the ones that are be be becoming most common problems in Africa, and those are the diseases that we're focusing on. So we, are, we have a, such a wide diversity, a wide collection. We have actually more than 200 lines uh, in our possession from Africa and from all over the world. And we've been screening all these and actually trying to group them based on phenotypes to see what would fit where. This research is collaborative. It's not really just something we invent here in the US and then we tell them in Africa what to do. We actually, before we even started this project, we had a meeting with all the host country uh, collaborators. And we decided, OK, how do we design this project to create the biggest impact? How do we select the lines? Who will do what? And that was a very, very important part of actually making this pro project work. Because if everybody's involved in designing, they feel much more interested in actually implementing it. And so everything is progressing fairly well. God is dark, but again, research capacity, because we don't want to be doing all, the, all the, the research here and then just sending the data to Africa. We want them to be involved in actually generating the data. And so part of the research capacity building is training them on how to do some of the analysis that would actually predict nutritional profiles of this cowpea and other, even other commodities. This was a part of the training we had in South Africa where we met with host country uh, students as well as collaborators. So we trained them on the laboratory techniques that they can use. And then again, that's our, uh, my colleague, my colleague Suzanne Talco, she's seated right there at the back. Here we were in Kenya, I think two months ago, three months ago or something, she was showing again, them how to do some of the analysis at Egerton University. And the training is not just showing them how to do it, but sometimes they can't afford uh, some equipment. So like this equipment, this was purchased through this project. 
we purchase the, project, the instruments that we know are very rugged and can function over, uh, uh, and uh, are not going to really break down fairly quickly. And then we send them to them, and then we show them how to use them, and so that they can do a large chunk of the research over there. Uh, what did I do? I think I screwed it up. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, it's bad. Sorry. Okay, again, we are using high-end tools. We are not just using the simplistic technology. We are using some of the high-end tools actually to demonstrate because, as I told you, the Africans are just as interested in this really high-quality data as we are. They're not just interested in being told eat more of this because it has iron and zinc. They want really good, solid data. The first thing they keep asking us, well, is there any evidence? That, where's the evidence? Is there any scientific evidence that this thing can do this for you? Because especially the government officials, we want, when we approach them, we want to promote this. They just say, show us the evidence, and then we will work with you. It will be much easier to promote if you have the evidence that is published. So we're trying to use some high-end tools to actually generate that kind of data. Again, seeking input from stakeholders. This, that was again, it, the picture doesn't show it very well, but that's Suzanne. Actually, we had a meeting where we were asking them, okay, how can, what can we do to really make this a successful project? Seeking their input and see what, how, they, how we can contribute. Yeah. It's not always just work when you go to overseas, especially in this foreign project, you have to refuel. And I was showing again Dr. Talcott how to consume some of the local delicacies. And, uh, she was, uh, it was an interesting one because it was a whole fish with the head and the skin and everything, and I don't think Suzanne has ever seen that before, and she could not figure out how to eat this thing because she's used to the, just the fillet. It was a, that was an interesting seeing her try to struggle eating that kind of a product. And I say it's not always, I mean, you can always, it's always the schedules are tight, but you can get an opportunity to also have fun. We actually went to a national park, which is in Nairobi, and you see this, uh, yeah, this is a national park, so this is not a zoo, they're actually in, a, in the wild. And you see, they're very, they, they really don't care much for cars because they're probably they see them all the time. So there's opportunity to be fun. Again, that's the park you see the Nairobi in the background. This is a national park right in the middle of the city. Again, our collaborators in Zambia and Kenya and South Africa. And as Suzanne, did you want to add something? I don't know if there's time. Probably consume too much time. But uh, Suzanne Talcott, seated back there, is a very a key collaborator. B.B. Singh, I don't know if he's here. He's also another important collaborator. Oh, seated right there, yes. B.B. Singh is a very important collaborator on this project, and we also have some colleagues at UC Riverside who are working with us. Thank you. <laughs>